to another episode of I Am My Brother's Keeper. I am the Funky Militant, Adar Jones. And as always, I got the tribe with me. So let the audience know who you are. My middle in here. We Mac, back and better than ever. And the mod in here too. What's up? What you doing? Absolutely, absolutely. Please make sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And check out our website, thegarageapt.com. So now, as y'all know, we are here at oh, I Am My Brother's Keeper. We are trying to debunk the idea that all black people are inherently criminal. So, of course, we have been having some candid conversations with uh, young brothers and sisters who are, are leading in our community. And we also have another brother who we know who, who, who goes a ways back. We watched him grow his business. We watched him mature into uh, another another contributor to to our progress. Got got Mr. Dave Anderson, man. Welcome to this garage apartment, man. What's up, garage apartment? Glad to be here, man. Appreciate y'all guys having me. Absolutely, man. So, um, of course, man, with 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 the unrest and everything that is going on, we uh, we all knew we did we wanted to do more and we wanted to to do something different because um of course it is it is is it's 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 easy to say that we need the help of others which we do because we can't do it all alone but of course in order right. to really see any true progress we need to do it ourselves man so um i i saw that i've been seeing that you've been quite vocal with how the 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 George Floyd uh, uh, murders and police brutality had impacted you, so just tell us a little bit about that and and what how that is going to and how you're going to use that as motivation to also push our progress forward. Well, first of all, man, you know how small of a world Houston is, and I'm not sure if y'all actually knew Big Floyd, but as as small as Houston is, it had been brought to my attention. Not only had we crossed paths, but our lives were, were kind of intertwined. Uh, most recently, I, I received an award from a big group of brothers called Icon Talks during the Super Bowl last time I was here in Houston. Floyd was there. Uh, Y'all remember me from my promoter days. Floyd would be a regular at the Shadow Bar. Mm. Um, but most recently, obviously, uh, Donkey Boy did a very nice mural. And, and through the mural, we were actually tapped by his OG mugs to do this. And this project has been pretty special because we've actually had to deal with some pretty unique feedback. And not all of it has been positive when talking about it. Some of it's been, hey, can you believe this man was had a history? Uh, he was maybe doing porn. He was a rapper. He had this. And my response to that is everyone has a history. Right, but guess what? Floyd is now a mortar yeah. for us as as people. He's a mortar for the civil rights movement. He's a mortar to stop racism. So my answer to anybody that was asking us about this mural and why we would pay tribute to a, such a man with a questionable background, hey man, it, it's who he is now and what he stands for, what he symbolizes, uh, and, and it's definitely hit home as a black man. I'm, almost positive everybody here in the garage right now has been confronted unfairly at least once in their life uh, by some kind of law enforcement. And to see that we now have time, space, and opportunity that's probably a little bit of the gift and the curse of this pandemic to actually sit still and do something about it, it's really a blessing. I'm hopefully... I'm cautiously optimistic that through this, there will be real change because now we're holding people accountable. Everyone's being held accountable. You know what I'm saying? Uh, corporations, brands, people, friends, so-called friends. We see where everybody stands now on this movement. So as someone in marketing and advertising, as a black man, um, yeah, I'm excited to see where, where this all goes. Um, and as I said again, I'm, I'm consciously optimistic that we're heading in the right direction. It's all about mobilizing, 
staying focused, and again, like I said, help holding everybody accountable. Absolutely, man. And so I forgot to mention that you are a, a managing partner at 2010, which is a division of Team Enterprises. Yeah. So just talk about what exactly what that is and, and, and what you guys do. So uh, Team Enterprises is a full-service marketing agency. Uh, we specialize in events, sampling, activations. Uh, some of our bigger clients include the Miller Coors family, uh, the Bacardi family. For those that don't know, Bacardi uh, on several of the brands that we love, Patron, uh, they own 50% of the Duce with Jay-Z, they own Bob A. Sapphire, and specifically the 2010 division, which was once my company, uh, is the multicultural division. So in this unique time, they need us more than ever, and they need people like us to translate culture not only for clients, but even internally, to really give the general market a complete understanding of what it's like to be African-American, Latino, Asian, LGBTQ. And while you may fall in one of those categories, everyone's African-American experience isn't the same. So we help not only brands, but also our agency understand the importance of being able to have authentic conversations with these demographics. Yeah, all, you just you just said a word as far as so you you are you are working from the inside as far as influencing some pretty um, influential companies. Absolutely. Um, what kind of pressure? What kind of pressure is there? Because I mean, oftentimes being in that industry, there there are very small numbers of people who look like us, and 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 all hey, my company is actually six percent. Okay, there you go. Have <laughs> very small number. <laughs> right, right, right. But so that also means that uh, um, you serve as direct representatives of, of black men oftentimes. So what kind of right. pressure is there? What kind of pressure is there being in that position, being in a, in, in, in a role of influence? And, and how do you carry, I don't want to make it a, a, bear, a, a burden, but how do you carry that? and make sure that you are being true to yourself, true to your people, true to your image, and making sure that you're also being successful and impactful. And also talk about um, what obstruction you might be experiencing or what, what experiences you might have of people trying to keep you from getting things done. You know what, I, I, I don't think it, it's, it's pressure. I think it's more of a responsibility, right? And it's a blessing to actually be in these rooms and have the influence and have these frank conversations. Uh, on our behalf and represent us because um, it, it didn't come overnight. So I want to make sure that I'm always putting my best foot forward and authentic self forward so that even after you meet a Dave Anderson and you meet a Gamal, that they understand us as people and as black men, right? And the stereotypical black man that's put on television and portrayed in the media isn't necessarily who we are, right? Um, so, I, like I said, I see it as an honor and a responsibility to let them know how well-rounded we are, that uh, we're fathers, we're sons, we're brothers, and we have a unique American experience here in the U.S. That's great. Uh, if you can, yeah, expunge or explain a little bit deeper on some of the things that you have experienced that that just, that sometimes has made you just step back and be like, wow, you know what I'm saying? That, mm. that uh, being able to be in these big companies uh, that may have come off the wrong way to you. You know, the biggest wow is always for me, and you, you, at a point you get used to it where – you just don't see anybody else that looks like us, first of all. Um, yeah, because we're the big, we're probably the, their biggest com customer. Right, or right. Um, the other wow is when I see pushback on spending corporate dollars, like you said, Gamal, towards recruiting their biggest client and investing in, in, in the culture. Thank you, sir. Um Sorry about that, fellas. Getting, getting a little dinner here. Uh, hey, hey, hey. 
Uh, but yeah, that that that's one of the things that bothers me is when I, <clears throat> when I see brands that that we support as as black people, not just as black men, um, not really want to give back and support our community or our culture. Um, it's like you know, for years and years and years, we've been supporting X Y Z brand, and then when you pull the report card and see what have they done to help the community, we're disappointed. And then when you hold hold their foot to the fire and say, Hey, look, you know. Why haven't you done this to invest in small businesses or in black businesses or in minority uh, vendors? They look at you like, why? Uh, so that goes back to us being accountable, saying, hey, XYZ brand, we're supporting you. What have you done for us? Oh, got a question. So, yeah, go for it. The importance of being in the room, you were stating how important that is. Um, if you were not in the room, would you say that that is a reason, does that contribute to a lot of the pitfalls that a lot of these companies have, not just in this social time now, but just in general how they don't necessarily see the foresight? I know they recognize the spending power that African Americans and black people have, but there's nobody being in the room seems like that would be detrimental to the idea. Yeah, yeah, that's, and it's not just for us as black men either. It's just having a, the, the uh, being well rounded, right? Um, not even speaking to blacks, but also to Latinos and Asians. But without having that diverse world view, or uh, even more more diverse multicultural view here in the U.S., not only sometimes do they miss the mark. So here's a good example. So when you look at some of the ads, um, I think. Pepsi may have missed the mark um, one time with something they did with Kylie Jenner. Yeah, with the Pepsi uh, commercial with the Super Bowl. With the Pepsi commercial, right? Yeah. Um, and then we've all seen, and, and nothing particularly comes to mind, where a brand just unauthentically checks the box of putting a black person in a commercial. Um, what about the nigga sweater with Gucci? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you get right or the H and M or the H and M ad. The H and M was cool oh, yeah. in the jungle. I I hope there wasn't one of us in that room that approved that. There wasn't one of us in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Not a perfect day. perfect example because if we were in the room, shit like that wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have worked. Yeah. So how do we how do we how do we get more people? like you and like that in those rooms because like you said we, we it's no secret that they always um of course they want our dollars but they don't necessarily value our dollars and because oftentimes we all know that um black black the black market the black consumer market basically pushes everybody's everybody's economy so how do we get more people to make sure that we are represented in those rooms and to make sure that they value what we truly do for them? I think if we had to have an action plan, a couple of things need to happen. A, people like me that are already in the room and need to extend a hand to other brothers and sisters and invite them into the room, either as working with us as, as a vendor working for us as part of our team and part of our staff. And then the flip side of it is, again, just holding brands and, and companies accountable. How many blacks are on your leadership team? We need to be asking that question. Mm -hmm. How many minority vendors are you guys hiring and employing? What do those contracts look like? Is it only 10% or are you really, are you guys really entrusting a, a a, a, a minority com minority owned company uh, with your business. So, again, those, those are the kind of two things. There's a responsibility for us, those of us that are in the room to make sure we leave the door open for other people that look like us. And then us as consumers holding brands, leagues like the NFL, uh, NBA accountable to make sure they're doing what's right not only for themselves, but also for us by making sure we're in that room and having these conversations. Yeah, see, the thing with me is <laughs> if, if they do that, what they're going to realize is they're going to realize that we do the job better than they do. And I'm going to tell you why. A person like you being in that room. Yeah. Now, they probably would just only, like, look to you for 
well, what's the black event? But the thing is, having to be black in America and mm-hmm. traversing the path that we're traversing, that kind of, you know, we're, you have your feet in uh, two different rooms. So it's about empathy and how you can identify with people. Oh, man, you hit on the head. Empathy. And see, us, we have to know about them. Right. We have to, con- we were just talking about media earlier, movies and stuff. We have to consume. This weekend, mm-hmm. and, and when it really hit me, it was Sunday morning, man. Uh, I was waking up. My wife was already watching some bullshit movie with <laughs> Ashton Kutcher's wife and uh, fucking uh, Justin Timberlake. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, some romantic comedy shit, you know? Anyway, I'm sitting there watching the movie, and I'm, not, I'm like, okay. And I got into it. You know, by accident. But I'm actually sitting here giving a shit about their relationship, caring about their characters. You feel me? And I'm watching the movie, and there's not a single Negro in there, right? And I sat there and I thought back. I'm like, okay, look here. I'm, I'm humanizing these people. But how many experiences, how often does this happen in a white household where they're sitting there watching a white, a bunch of black people? And sitting there being into it, being lovable. That's not like, like, I love The Wire. That's one of my favorite shows. But mm-hmm. if you see black people on TV, you're watching The Wire or something like that, you know? There you go. Yeah. It's not anything like that. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, we're sitting here giving a shit about these white characters because we can empathize with these people. Your grandfather grew up watching uh, John Wayne. <laughs> you know? It's the images. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think if they let us in, they would realize that you know what they know they know us pretty well too. You can go right. in there and run that company because you could you you have to run in those circles. You have to know what the you have to be bilingual. You have to know white language, and then you know the language of your own people. Yep. You know. So I don't know. That just came to mind. Um, as far as you saying people like you letting other people in, mm-hmm. how easy is that? Or how hard is that more? Rather? It's not always easy. Mm-hmm. Right? Because half the time when I'm in the room, it's, they right check that box. Mm-hmm. And it has, they think it's no more room for us. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like to think that, you know, when I am in that room, I do earn enough trust and respect for them to trust my opinion and say, hey, look, you know what? Let's make this really a well-rounded conversation for me to invite some other brothers or even our Latino brothers and sisters that look like us. Mm-hmm. So this is a really true conversation. It really looks like what the U.S. really looks like. Um, so short answer is it's, it's not always easy. Um, but I think you can make a good case for why it's important to have us in the room. And you think you talk about influencing, right? Mm-hmm. Who really influences not just American culture or pop culture, but international culture. Oh, the look world. At anything, yeah. Right? Look at look at what we're wearing. Look at how people yeah. talk. Look at yeah. the sports. I remember look, I told the Nigerian fashion. dude one time, I said, yo, you can't talk about us. We made black cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You made it okay for you to be black, Nigerian dude. Uh, preach. <laughs> okay. Preach. Calm down. Preach. We made being preach. black cool, bro. <laughs> and all we all we did with all we're doing is telling our story. Yeah. Through the music, through the fashion. And half the time it's it's us just being true to ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Like we weren't out there trying trying to get this fame. We just tell them what it's like. Um, so now, but yeah, how, and that, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. But how how far <laughs> do you push? What I mean by that is because of course, there are things that might be said or done that you wouldn't necessarily agree for, uh, agree with, and of course you have to advocate, and you have to give uh, compelling yeah, arguments to advocate for that. So now, how strong do you advocate? Now, do you go so far as to the point, because if you push so far that finally either you have to be removed or you decide to remove yourself from the situation, it almost is uh, counterproductive, because now there's nobody in the room. Right. Um, but then how much do you also force yourself to tolerate understanding that, look, I got an opportunity here. I need to take advantage of that. 
Um, but there's still some, there's only so much that I will tolerate. So how far do you push? Man, I feel like that's a personal decision, right? I think for me, as long as it doesn't compromise my moral ethics and the way I was raised, I'm going to keep pushing. Uh, the other part of it is without trying to lose the business. I think sometimes you also got to hurt, hurt, hurt feelings and just be honest. Um, not only with them, but also with yourselves, right? That what it, what it, what it's worth. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a, actually a line in the sand that you can define as this. This is as far as I take it. Like I said again, for me that that line is. I don't want to lose business, but at the same time, I'm gonna do what I can. Uh, without compromising my, my morals, rights, and ethics. Um, but I think the better work you do, the more the more leverage that your, your opinion will have in these meetings. So let me ask y'all. What, 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 okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, let me, let me ask y'all, brothers, what do you guys think, you know, someone – in corporate America, especially me working in advertising, what responsibilities do you guys think that that someone like myself should have or could be doing more of? If anything, which I'm sure there is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, somebody like you, not Mm -hmm. not personally you, Yeah. I believe they should be doing what you're saying. They mm-hmm. should be holding this door open uh, and and holding people accountable. Right. Because, like I said, we made it cool to be black. We made it cool for white people to be black. Preach. You know what I'm saying? We made, yep. it, cool. We made it cool for everybody to really be who they are. Yep. Um. It's disappointing how money and power easily corrupt people, uh, even in the most subliminal way. Uh, I, I'm saying in reference to, let's say, Virgil mm-hmm. with his off-white mm-hmm. and the amount of money that our people give to him stand in line, not only money, but money and time. Because we stand in line. We wait on websites. We pay so much for these shoes. And when there's a time for him to give back, he gives just a fraction of that. $50. Exactly. Not not even, I don't, I'm not asking for all, but give, give, Give what you feel was a concerted effort by your people to put you where to for other people to look at you and put you where you are now. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's how he felt. I mean, if that's how he felt, then again, you can be wrong with your feelings. You can be wrong with your feelings. You know who, do think, who, who do y'all think is doing it right? Do y'all think someone like a Puff or me personally? I think a Jay Z. Quiet is kept is in the right rooms, having the right conversations, i.e. with the NFL. Uh, that a a lot that we're not really privy to, but I just respect his decision making. Um, I think what he's trying to do for justice reform, criminal justice reform, what he's trying to do for culture, and making sure that there is black ownership. Is, is more than commendable. I really feel like Jason run for president one day. But I think we do need more brothers like that that are using their platform uh, not only to help us now, but help us in the future. Yeah, well, for me, man, one of the major problems is because we all work in different industries and we're all trying to, because I know I am, I'm trying to shift the culture. <laughs> In my right. industry, also as much as I can, uh, right. And there's a lot of us doing that in a whole lot of different places. Number one, right. The higher you move up, it's not as many of us, right? Okay. 
Like, <laughs> when I first started working for the city in Houston, I was like, man, there's a lot of, a lot of black people work here. Then as I moved up in management, I was like, oh, this is where the white boys at. <laughs> oh, that's where y'all at. Right, right. I'm here. Oh, okay. You know, I thought we ran the whole shebang. But one of the problems is, is that in order to get that real influence and to have that kind of money, it has to be somebody like Jay-Z and, and, and Puff, the people you mentioned. And it's just a shame that, you know, because the boss said money and power, but power is what we're talking about anyway. Mm -hmm. We're talking about power, how to distribute power. We're, tr we're talking about using our consumer power right. to drive these brands and things to do the right thing and to hold themselves accountable, hold their vendors accountable, hold everybody accountable. Yep. The thing is, you have to be, you know, like, it shouldn't be up to Jay-Z. Jay was rapping in the Marcy Project 30 years ago, 25 right. years ago. Like, I mean, it's great that he's there, and it's great that somebody like him makes it. Great. But Jay Z is an exceptional talent. That's some. It's almost like winning the lottery, right? You know, in order to get to that spot. Now, like, I'm with you. I love what he's doing with the spot that he has. Right. But Jay Z, when he's in those boardroom meetings, the problem is he's not sitting across from people who are exceptional talent at any damn thing. They right. sit next to somebody who was somebody's son who was able to get in the pen and get in the uh, a Wharton uh, the fucking business school or mm -hmm. Harvard Business School and just be there. You know? And right. all that stuff is passed down generationally. Now, it's a big thing what you're doing and what you do with these major brands because these are the people that, you know, this is where most people are going to go. Right. But I think a lot of it is going to start because I know, like, you started off pretty much, you know, okay, one of my questions is, what made you decide to go into the industry you went into? What made you decide to become an influencer? And uh, I know that you did a lot of things, uh, you know, on your own, entrepreneurship-like, right? Yep, yep. So what made you go that route? And how, because I think, I think that's the key to get more people like you, more young men coming up. And what are you doing to mentor other guys to become entrepreneurs and do things for Man, themselves? Man, that's, that's a great... Excuse me, all great questions. Hey, I didn't, I didn't seek to become an influencer. You know, when we were coming up, I don't even think there were influencers. They're like influencers came with social media, mm -hmm. and so we weren't really doing that. I think. Uh, well, there know, were. The only thing is, it was like four or five of them. There you go. Yeah, After like the natural, see. natural maturation <laughs> right. of kind of my career from nightlife. Um, and work with spirits companies evolved into events, marketing, doing more with brands, even outside of the liquor companies, uh, just with the influence I had inside of the nightclub. So being able to tell the, the nightclub owners, hey, uh, you need to bring in XYZ brand um, and not only bring it in, but I'm going to make sure it sells. And it went from, you know, doing it with my handful of clubs here in Houston to being able to do the, do the same thing uh, countrywide. Um, as far as what am I personally doing, man, I'm a each one teach one type brother. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not trying to sit in this seat forever. I'm trying to groom the next generation of Dave Anderson, uh, man. And luckily, I'm, I'm working with some really cool young brothers. One particularly that comes to mind is my guy Mikos Adams, man. You know, not only did I see a lot of a lot of myself in him. But I see, as he would say, more, right? So not only do I want to help groom him, but I want to make sure that he's in these rooms so people get used to seeing more than just me in there. Um, and I want to, lack of better words, give him the game, right, that I wasn't necessarily, I don't feel like the generation ahead of me held the door open for me. I don't want to just hold the door open. I want to get the party started and say, look, while I'm here, y'all come in now. And this is what we're doing. So that's one of the things I also, I don't only do it, but I also challenge my, my team to do the same. Like, okay, uh, Tammy, one of the young ladies, has also grown with me in my agency, going from cashier to now making six figures um, and running all of our Bacardi business. 
but I constantly ask her, who's up next? Who's next for you when you move up? So it's, it's important that there's some kind of mentorship. So now let me ask you, which, and, and this is, and, and again, I guess this is still a question of, of, of uh, preference, but which, yep. what, which do you believe is more impactful? Because representation means everything. Representation plays a major role in the aspirations of those who come behind you, because sometimes, right. Right, in another conversation we were having, we were talking about exposure, and oftentimes young kids are just not exposed to certain things. So when they see somebody right. doing it, then they go, "Oh, I can do that." I can do it. So yeah. which do you believe yeah. is more? Which 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 do you believe is more impactful? Whether to be in the front in the front of the camera, being seen all the time, or working behind the scenes? Which one is more impactful? I'm a behind the scenes guy. And I'm gonna say that all the time. Um, I feel like that's where the real work is done, behind the scenes. Um, a lot of times, the people in the forefront are being told what to do by the guys behind the scenes, right? The directors um, making it happen. So I think the work that's being done behind the scenes is definitely more more impactful, more beneficial for us. All right. Really, that's, that, that's what pays away and directs it. All right, so let's let's now take it let's take it back a little bit. Well all right, let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. You're a UVA grad? Yes, sir. Uh, being, spending your four years in Charlottesville, you had uh, your influence, I mean, well, your experiences. Yep. And, of course, a few years ago, we saw that craziness yep. in Charlottesville with the TE torches. How, how impactful was that for you to even push more to show that we're not you you specifically mm -hmm. are not going to let what those behind the scenes will affect your overall uh, I won't say image but impact on what these big companies are going to do. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, uh, let me see if I can clarify it. So, um, the, I guess the alt-right march that happened mm -hmm. in, in Charlottesville, yep. Charlottesville. And, the, and the craziness that those, those same people may have been, may be sitting at the table with you. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Even though the uh, you you've already talked about the pushback, but again, you don't want to over over push your push, your push. But how important is it for you to make sure that the truth about what you you stand up for is being shown through uh, the these companies that are that are uh, in, investing in in your uh, power. I man, I think it's, it's, it's important. Uh, you know, like, like we said from the get-go, man, uh, authenticity. It's all about being authentic and make sure brands understand that we are being represent true to our nature, true to who we are, true to what we call the black experience. Uh, or even the, the, the Latin experience, right? To make sure that we're not being misrepresented. Um, that's very important. And it's important that we represent ourselves as such. So to, to kind of piggyback off of that, um, I guess at which point do you, at which point, or has there ever been a time when you had to kind of fall back in order to make sure the deal gets done? Or are there at a certain point was there a principal time where you said if you don't meet this or if you don't understand where I'm coming from then I just can't do business with you? How, did, how does that go into effect? How do you kind of counterbalance that or when and when you should not kind of give or take or pick your battles? Man, that's a good question. I think it varies with each stage of your career. 
Um, I think the more seniority you have, the more leeway you get with um, what you can say and what you can do. Uh, I think, the, and then the less you need the business, um, I feel like you're able to make more coherent uh, decisions, right? So now I'm at a place where obviously I don't, I don't need the business. Uh, so if the business doesn't align with my core set of values or what I hope to be paid, um, I'm blessed to have the liberty to say, nah, this is not the right business for me. Not, and y'all all know, not all clients are good clients. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, I'm going to be honest, there's definitely, definitely some clients I ended up taking uh, just for the dollar when I know it wasn't, they ne- didn't necessarily see my vision for them and didn't necessarily uh, represent our culture true to the nature that I saw for us. Um, now, I do say that with the caveat that I'd never let them do anything that was counterproductive for us as black people, but I definitely didn't always agree with what they were doing. Yeah. See, the problem is, and, and first off, let me commend you for the way that you uh, ate your dinner. On the camera. <laughs> you did a very good job of not, you know what I'm saying, I, I was just on the Zoom football meeting with my son of youth football team with the coaches, and niggas was slurping fettuccine and shit. <laughs> it was tripping out. So I want oh, to commend man. you for that. You did a great I job. I appreciate it, man. Multitasking, multitasking. Precisely. Yes, sir. Um, hopefully you'll influence people to do that. But uh, uh, the problem with that, man, is uh, how many of us have the money and and the financial security to say no to anything? Because one of the problems, and the problem... Especially in this climate right now where one-fourth of us are are unemployed or been furloughed. Yeah, Yeah, that too. But any Mm -hmm. climate that... Black people have ever existed in, right? Right. Because the problem is somebody does make it. Uh, you know, um, we got a lot of people to take care of. Yep. It's a lot of people depending on my paycheck. You might have to send home back to your mama, send money home. Right. You know what I'm saying? Send money to yep. the family, get bail yep. for your cousin. You know, all kind of shit like that. So, yep. I think that's economically first is where we fall short. Now, for me, right. I know that the big brands and all that, you'll never be able to skirt those. But I think one of right. the things we can do is build our own stuff. Yeah. And Preach. no matter how shabby you think it might be, you still got to support it. <laughs> we still got to fuck with it. How can, yep. Because in this venture that we've all uh, started uh, last year, um, just trying to get people to come... The, the people that are friends and family come and support by teachers, that kind of thing. How do we change that paradigm to where we understand that we have to support that business? We have to support our own stuff to get to that power. You know, I think it starts at home in the upbringing. Mm-hmm. When we bring that check back to mama or to the kids, help them understand the importance of the black dollar and keeping it in the black community. Right? So... Mm-hmm changing the, the, the narrative at home to understand it's not we only do it because we're black but there are some great black brands out there and some black companies doing some really wonderful things Fantastic. right uh-huh. so um just just telling 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 black stories um and and supporting our own is important Shit, where we eat what we buy what what we're using in our, in our daily lives. I'm sure there's a, a wealth of information and resources out there, either through through y'all here at the garage or online, uh, to where we can find these black businesses that we support. But I think it, it happens at home, and we're teaching our kids and educating our family members that there are options um, for us to support our own. Yeah. Hey, and we so definitely got to do a better job of doing that. Definitely. So uh, who influenced you? Who put that uh, independent, that uh, entrepreneurial spirit in you? Was it something you learned at home? It definitely is. It was definitely my mama. And it wasn't because she was an entrepreneur. It was because she wasn't. Mm-hmm. At an early age, she was like, you know, they, 
A, she used to ask me every morning to define what an entrepreneur is. B, she would show me the other side of her working nine to nine and saying, you don't want to do this. I make X, Y, Z company this amount of money, and I don't see a fraction of it. Yeah. So at an early age, I was being taught uh, the importance of entrepreneurship and owning your own. And so by instilling that in me at an early age, I always thought that's something I shouldn't be able to do and could do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so thank you, Mama. Yeah, exactly, right? Thank you, Mama. Hey, so um, how did you go about finding other people with your mindset, other young men like you to get with in those early days and all of that? Man, I, I, I think it actually, I, I got lucky, man. Shout out, shout out our guy, Jermaine Patterson and Jay Kanye. Uh, yeah. With, with yeah. hanging out with yeah. like-minded people, right? Like-minded brothers like y'all. And make sure we all get together and talking. Um, but like like people say, man, hang around people, doing what you want to do or better. Uh, been very blessed and fortunate to have good discernment on who I surrounded myself with. And uh, very blessed just to have good friends and, and family and associates that understand the importance of, of loyalty and uh, respect. Uh, let's go, let's go back to, uh, well, at any point, when was there a time, if you can remember, uh, when you did a a promotion or a project mm-hmm. where that big company came to you and was like, wow, I never really knew you could do it like that. I never saw it done that way. You opened my eyes to what this experience really is about. Man, I, man luckily, I feel like that almost happens every day. Uh, I feel like I'm always trying to overachieve and, and while my clients and even while the people I work with, that I, I do get a sense of satisfaction often uh, that we exceed their expectations. Because sometimes y'all know they try to lower the bar for us, um, not thinking that we can either compete at the same level or better. So often, often that happens. And uh, second question. Yeah. To this day, what inspires you? Man, knowing that, uh, hey, I can do more, right? I can do more, um, that our work here isn't done. Uh-oh. That nigga got that elevator. He's in the elevator. That nigga got that elevator. Yeah, he in the elevator right now. <laughs> so we're gonna have to ask we're gonna have to ask him that one again. He answering that bitch right now. I know. Oh there you go. I'm back. I'm back. There you go. So so you got to answer that one again for I'll tell you what 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 keeps me going, man, is you know, I keep this number on my refrigerator. Two billion seven hundred and thirty six million four hundred and fifty six thousand seven dollars twenty six cents. What does that number represent? I think everyone needs to have a number or a goal that they're working towards, right? So, like, what's your number? And for some people, it's not even a number. But for me, I feel like I can tie monetary value to things that I want to accomplish and succeed in. So, for me, being able to hit that number, knowing that I I wake up every morning, that's not in my bank account, that I'm motivated to do more and and, and achieve that success. That coupled with, man, that... You know, our, our job isn't done here. Um, to to make culture better and, and make make this world a better place. Now, see, you just said something there, and I actually have a number too, but my number is a little bit smaller than yours. Mine is eighty six thousand four hundred, and and okay. and now in terms of in terms of money, that's a small number because how this question is posed, I, I um, a bunch of the kids that I mentor, I always ask them. Um, if I give you eighty six thousand four hundred dollars, what would you do with that? And you know, they they mm-hmm. tell me about the things they would do, how they take care of their mama, or they would. Uh, or I even had one kid say, "Man, I go back to my projects and fix up the projects." And all, all that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's mature. Um, I so can, then I go to Carmax and get two bins. 
<laughs> right, absolutely, and that's what I'm saying. So there's, you know, that that our our next generation, although you know they get a bad rap, but they actually very they got some beautiful minds with some very pure and noble intentions. But so with that number, the reason that it, my number is eighty six thousand four hundred is that's how many seconds are in a day. Right. So you're given you're given for every day that you wake up, you're given eighty six thousand four hundred seconds every day. Wow. What are you going to do with those, and how do you make sure those that those count? So now, how I how I, I pose that question to the kids, I told you I make it monetary, and I ask them what they're going to do. And then, I, like I said, they have these big grand ideas, and then some of them are very beautiful ideas. And then I ask them, okay, so now I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's how many seconds are in the day, and you're being blessed with those every time mm. you wake up. Mm. So how do you make sure that each one of those seconds count and how do you make sure that each one of those are valuable and that you are contributing and making the world better? Mm. Mm. So That's now fine, with brother. that, I'm going to use that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you more than welcome. You more than welcome right. to have that one. What's gems, that? that's gems. Because now that, that brought me up to my next question because I want you to, to, a billion smiles. What is a yeah. billion smiles, man? You know that's my 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 life project, man. That's my my Magna Carta. Uh, I feel like so outside of that the, the monetary number, I feel like I will be satisfied. I will be satisfied when I've influenced a billion people to smile, either directly or indirectly. And it's uh, going to be my nonprofit and charity, but it also is a movement to pay it forward. So I hope that when people one day see the hashtag a billion smiles, they know that someone paid it forward. So i.e., maybe it's just buying the person behind you a cup of coffee with no expectations and nothing in return just to brighten their day. That's what it's about. And I figure if we can put a billion smiles, I think, you know, you can you can tie that to, to life change. I know that what you realize, I think, Everyone knows when you put a smile on someone else's face, the sense of satisfaction and, and, and the good, the, the warm and fuzzies that you get from doing that, um, probably are better than when you actually receive that smile. So it's just a movement to each one person, one at a time, make the world a better place, one smile at a time by paying it forward. Already, already. That is, that, that's. I, and I've always enjoyed that mission that you've had since day one. I remember you buying some uh, some KFC uh, one Frenchies. time. Frenchies. Yeah, Frenchies one time, man. And, and it really did put a smile on their face. And uh, I know indirectly, I've told this story uh, last episode that even though my the teacher I work with doesn't know mm-hmm. of, I will put her on 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 you, but she doesn't know about your billion smiles. She, we work in the behavior class, mm-hmm. and she she really feels their pain, mm-hmm. you know, and she really feels their pain as a person, and to achieve them to just have a a great day or even a great week. She buys them Popeyes. Mm. And it's just amazing how the simplest things yeah, there is. can make somebody happy just throughout that day. Even if they mm-hmm. may be mad tomorrow, just that mm-hmm. moment, that one moment is just so gratifying just to see kids that are that have always had troubles and traumas and and problems just to to smile to be yep. free to be there yep. to be yeah you know, yeah and, and i and i've always loved that mission from you and just know there are other people out here trying to achieve your I mission even it. indirectly and i appreciate it man i appreciate it i feel like you know the society especially here in the u.s so much hustle and bustle that Sometimes it feels kind of cutthroat, like we always in competition with each other. Um, when we don't, we don't realize, you know, the little things that could really affect your day or, or even change your life, man. 
Uh, so it's, it's a blessing to be able to be a blessing. So now let me ask you about this, just to, uh, uh, because you, you said that, you know, you have worked and you're fortunate enough to now that you have a little leverage and that you you can pick and choose uh, which businesses that you take on as a client. So how hard do you vet the companies that you take on um, um, and what are some criteria that they have to have for you to say, you know what, I'm going to put my stamp on this and I'm going to advocate for these guys um, how strong, what, what what are those things? And also, uh, sacrificed uh, to put another, another a black-owned company or something like that uh, in, uh, uh, in front, because just to give them the opportunity to, 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 to get to where you're trying to go or get to where you are. Um, I'm sorry. My FaceTime, someone was trying to FaceTime me. Can you you mind asking that again for me, Dory? Yeah, well, for the, yeah, no problem, no problem. The first question was how, how what do you, how do you vet companies? Mm -hmm. um, because you are fortunate enough to, to to be able to be picky with your business now. How right. do you what are what are criteria that they how do they prove themselves? Because I think it's it's very big and important that you said that companies now have to prove themselves to you. Got it. So, so what do you use? What are the deciding factors when you're vetting companies? Man, you know, it's it's kind of cool. Um, a, it's a lot of referral business. B, I go after companies and brands whose stories and people I like or the brand I like as, a, as a, either a product or a service. Uh, so the number one thing is, is this some, something I would use as a product or service even if they weren't my client? Um, I'm fortunate to say that all all my clients, their product or service, I can stand behind. So that's number one. Can I stand behind it, me, myself, and I, Dave Anderson, and feel comfortable saying, hey, yeah, I also will drink Douce. I also will drink Bacardi. Um, and this is why. This is, is their brand story. These are the people that are in the office making it or working, working behind the brand, and it tastes good. Um, that's the number one thing. I think the other part of it is when you peel back the onion and you peel back the layers and you look at their corporate practices and you find everything to be normal. Um, and it's just a, a a cherry on top and we can influence them uh, to do more business with us as black people and, and even more. And going back to an earlier conversation where they realize, hey, look, you know, this is why you can, these, these are the benefits of doing um, business with a, a minority company, and that's the the world roundedness. The other stories that are coming out that are sometimes non traditional, never been heard of before, and we're getting them into places that maybe they weren't in before. Uh, but then to go back and answer your question, number one thing is: is this a, a product or a service that I would use? And then when you peel back the layer, uh, what is that brand story? And does it align with who I am? So how would you, I'm sorry, just a follow up for me would be, so how would you go, How I guess have there been situations when you aligned with the brand you thought it was good and then once you either so started like or something came out in the media later on that you didn't know and what would occur then? Do you just disavow? Do you want to have a conversation? Are you trying to see exactly you know, I, man, to be completely frank, man, I've been blessed. I haven't run into that situation yet. Um, but I would, you know, give them a chance to, A, explain themselves, because it, it may not be what I what it seems, um, and I could be wrong. B, if it is what it, what it seems, can, can we take corrective measures and corrective action to fix the problem together, whatever that is, not enough, um, not enough diversity on their board or decision makers? could be one of the issues because that's important to me. So can can they take corrective action? Are they are they hiring enough black and brown people? Um is the product and service living up to the quality and standard that this that they're asking us to sell. So Okay. Well I hope you don't ever have to run into that <laughs> man, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Man, let me ask y'all and I'd like to know what are y'all listening to these days? Music wise. 
I'm I'm old school, man. <laughs> I'm 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 I'm, I'm, say I'm an old head, man. I'm not listening to no, well, let me not say nothing new, but I'm I'm a bit stubborn, man. I have not I just can't I, I can't. I'm trying. I really am trying. And there's some it's some, it's some cats that are really out here doing some good stuff, but uh uh to sound at the risk of sounding like an old man because I'm really not that old. But <laughs> it's just I can't I can't get with it, bro. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. So I still got a lot of outcasts still in the box. A hey, lot of um, originators. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 what's still in mind. I mean, I'm with uh, uh, Crit. Yeah, I like that. Uh, new schoolish. I'm listening to people like uh, Mozzie. Uh, uh, what's your boy? Uh, uh, of course, Toby. Oh, All right, boy, Toby. Yeah, Toby. Yeah. And uh, ah, he's gonna hate me for forgetting his name. Uh, the other guy from A Leaf. They got in a fight with Rizzo. I know that it doesn't sound too positive. <laughs> you listen to Max O'Cream? Max O'Cream. Right, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I did I a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I, I I really I really try to get it. The the kids at my school say I look like Rod Wave. <laughs> So I, I, I see that little song. Little song. So, <laughs> so I, I I try to listen to him just to be on the kids level to see what they're talking about. Uh, a little bit of a young boy. I mean, he he needs to cool out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, that's really really bad. And then there's some some local people like Les. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ellie Dallas. I'm the fuck with Les. Yeah, uh, my my boy uh, George Young. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and 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 folks like that, uh, Under Gravity. Okay. Man, uh, y'all uh, y'all got to be on the lookout for uh, this kid I'm working with, man, Mufasa Enzer, man. Okay. He's doing some really good stuff. Uh, he's not there yet where you you'll readily hear about him, but you got a couple things, a couple projects out there. He's doing some amazing things production wise. Uh, we got Wiz Khalifa. Listening to his music and a huge fan of his production and beats. So, man, look look out in the next 52 weeks, man. Mufasa is gonna be the next next talent I work with. That's really gonna blow on the music scene. Um, man, I'm with y'all, man. I'm still old school, man. I can put in some UGK all day for me, man. Exactly. All right. Let me. I can listen to Pin you know, C. Yeah, it's crazy you asked that because that was gonna be my next question: is 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 what's next? What's next for Dave Anderson? What's next for 2010? What's next for Team Enterprise? What's next? And 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 how are you again pushing that to contribute to uh, not only moving the culture forward but making sure that it's responsible and making sure that it is is generating, it is producing generations of responsibility. Man, that's actually a great question. I think it's going to mm-hmm. bring this whole conversation full circle. Full circle. So the highest agency is what's next. Uh, it's my talent management company that I co-own with DJ Mr. Rogers. Um, and I've had, I'm, I've enjoyed, and I still enjoy working with brands and corpor- corporations. But as we start the conversation with me being an influencer, man, now I'm trying to influence the influencers. And, um, uh, bring a great group of creative talent in the humanities, in the arts, music, uh, science, etc., that are next to influence culture, grooming them for corporate brands uh, and brand partners as well for them to be the best artists and talents that they can be. Uh, so the heist agency is what's next. The motto is still the show. We come up for everything. Um, shout out Donkey Boy, shout out DJ Shante, shout out DJ Mr. Rogers, shout out Gracie Chavez, um, shout out Robert Hodge. Um, mm, mm, yeah, hey, hey. That's, that's, Juve. that's, local, that's so, luck, local boy right there, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a Hodge piece behind me. Oh, yeah, huh? I, I know, Hodge, yeah. I know Hodge's, Hodge's so, music and, and uh, his art. So that, so that that's what's next for me, man. Influencing culture through through who's next uh, in the humanities, arts, and music. As far as what I'm listening to, obviously, man, I'm listening to my own. I'm listening to Mufasa. 
and what he's doing. Uh, I like Larry June out of Oakland, man. That boy Larry June goes hard. Okay. Y'all haven't heard him. Man, the best nah, music I'm, I've heard. I'm taking notes. Best music I've heard this year. Uh, man, that new Freddie Gibbs, Alfredo Project is something special. Yeah, yeah I did hear that. Yeah, I heard yeah that. I, I've heard a few cuts on that. And yeah, he, yeah. He, he's, he rapping. Yeah, he rapping, rapping. He getting at it. Rap. Man, and, and Gamal, you'll love this one, man. I, in that same lane, Lance has a nephew named Trayvon. Goes by 7098 out of San Antonio. Okay. He be spitting, man. He 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 makes he makes young Lance proud, man. But this young brother out of San Antonio, seventy ninety eight, is doing something special lyrically too. Okay, I, I will always, you know, I'll cut for anything y'all personally yeah. have hands in. I appreciate it, but yeah, look out, look out for those. And I think if you notice, man, it's not just what we're doing for Black culture, but I have a special, you know, kinship because I feel like they're in the same struggle. What us are the Latinos, uh, our, our brown brothers and sisters, man, and it's a lot of, a lot of. Uh oh, you coming back? I'm back. I'm about to let that yeah, get your call, call. <laughs> man. That, you know what, man? That's wifey, man. That might be my call. <laughs> I got to bring that to an end. Yeah, that's she, cool. She ain't around much longer, but uh, now nah, look out for the work we doing with the heist agent. Yep, up. Wifey's like, look, dude. I appreciate you. Nah, that was Willie D this time. <laughs> <laughs> that was Will. But nah, man, I appreciate the time. I hope y'all have me back in the garage. When this pandemic break, man, I really want to come hang in the garage with y'all boys, man. I love yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you got to come to the studio. Man, I love the conversation. Anytime y'all brothers want to have me back, I love to come through and uh, bring a little something for us to sip on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And, and you know, like a PA party. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We appreciate it. Before you get out of here, man, go ahead and, and drop your social media and let people know how they can get at you and follow you and, and, and contact you or, or, or pr- bring a business plan or whatever they might be proposing to you. Man, y'all know what's up. Hit me up, DA3. Uh, people call it DA3, but really stands for Dave Anderson, and I'm the third. And third was my favorite hood in Houston. <laughs> so D A T H R E E uh on all social platforms. All right. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you, brother. Uh you know, we go we go the ways back and yes, I, I, I just absolutely love watching the growth and watching and watching uh uh what you are becoming and what you are going to become. Um, um, and that you are, are definitely pulling people with you, man. So I appreciate that very much. Fellas, y'all got anything else? Man, I appreciate it, man. Stay ready. Right. Already. <laughs> Already. For sure. For sure. So, man, we definitely going to stay in touch with you, man. And I appreciate the love, brother, and the opportunity, man. Um, you are listening to uh, I Am My Brother's Keeper of the Garage Apartment, man. Uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter. Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, thegarageapt.com. Oh, man, y'all be blessed. Uh, Say it again. Say it again. Be good if you can't. Say it again. Oh, was I robotting right there? The garage. The garage. A. Jesus, man. No, he's struggling, man. He's struggling. Garage APT. Dot com. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> you got to drop my DA. That's what we're talking about. And he's man. still broke. Love y'all boys, man. Keep the face. Keep fighting a good fight, man. All right, appreciate man. it, man. Appreciate it, man. Always Later. proud of you, bro. Appreciate it, man. Talk to y'all. All right. All right. Hey. Follow the Garage Department on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Tweet, photos, videos. Let me share some real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Department Radio on YouTube.